to, to become digital soon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So everybody has been vaccinated, also the children from early age? Um, no, no, no. Children only start by now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But nearly all students I was speaking to were vaccinated. I, I don't have okay. students coming to me only with the testing result. How about you? Are you in presence? No, you are doing everything online now. How is yeah. that? Yeah, we, we start uh, the online meeting like two mm -hmm. weeks ago, but it's uh, selected and limited only for two uh, subject. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, because um, we still prepare for the infrastructure. Yeah. The room with the shield and also all the other infrastructure. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, let me uh, call Ivumaya. Vivi is wearing a mask even though she's on the computer. <laughs> <laughs> hello, 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 nice hello, to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice to meet you. And yeah. I would like to say thank you in this opportunity for sending the video to me last time. Which one? The video for my inauguration. Ah, why did you find it? Because my husband sent it to you. And then yeah. in the last minute, <laughs> we noticed that you didn't get it or what happened. So no, no, I, I hope that it was good because mm -hmm. it is, it is. And it's already been presented in my inauguration. Uh -huh. Okay, so <laughs> congratulations again. Well done. Thank you. I'm happy to see you full professor. Excellent. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And hopefully uh, we can continue yeah, the plan. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. yeah, yeah I think yeah. so. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> it, it should be in these days that I'm switching again to technical mm -hmm. university. So I think that's all working yeah. out mm -hmm. well. I hope. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, this is already three o'clock. I don't know whether we should yeah, start we, now. We, we can start. Yeah. Huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we just we... noticed in the last moment that we have a time shift so that we are yeah. on winter schedule. In German, yeah, yeah. I thought it's not 10 o'clock for me, it's yeah, 9, nine o'clock. <laughs> So in the morning. Uh, no, no, that's not. Yeah. Anyway, would you, um, can you share? Yeah, you shared already. Uh, uh, I will uh, ask uh, uh, Felicitas. I will ask Bumaya yeah. to open uh -huh. to open the uh -huh. yeah, yeah. international lecture Excellent. series first. She is uh, uh -huh. uh, mod the moderator. Okay. Bumaya. Okay. Hello. Hello, Felicitas. Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. Great. I am pleased to meet all of you. Okay. We yeah. lost your voice, Bumaya. Yeah, yeah. I think it, I think it's my connection, but not really. Yeah. Okay, please, Bumaya. And we lost her now. I think. Is it Bu <laughs> Landu? Yeah, I think because I don't see uh, oh, yeah, microphone yeah. notification, yeah. microphone yeah. picture here. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Check. So maybe while we wait for Bumaya, we can I can little bit uh, introduce uh, or open this. Yeah, Bu Landung and Bu Feli, yeah. please. Yeah. Uh, first of all, of course, on behalf of the department, uh, it's really grateful to have Bu Feli, Professor Hilman here, and. Uh, Thank you also for allo allocating the times to share uh, lecturing with our students in collaboration with Bulando. Sorry. Yeah. And, and now we already have Bu Maya back here. In this uh, opening session, I just would like to say uh, thank you to uh, Ibu Felicitas and Ibu Landung and also all the teams who already arranged the lectures. Uh, we also have here some lectures from our department. Bu Felicitas, we have Pak Wisnu Pradoto here. Thank you, Pak Wisnu, uh, for joining us. And also some Hello, other Felicitas. lectures. Hi. <laughs> Good to yeah. see you. Good to see you. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. 
And we also have Pak Saripudin, our, our younger colleagues who at the moment take the PhD in uh, in the Netherlands and at Bot University. Nice to have him here also and some other uh, lectures. And of course, uh, most of the students here, uh, they are in their third years mostly, I guess. Uh, so uh, I hope this can be regarded as a good experience, of course, for them uh, to have uh, some sharing from from. While you are still having problem with the connection, please. I'm sorry, Bumaya. Please continue. Thank you very much, Bumiwi, for uh, yeah, for helping me in the opening Zoom sessions. So we thought. Uh, okay. And um i can hear you only partly it's not working very well maya could you could you repeat what yes. you were saying? Hello, Professor Felicitas, are you ready? I'm ready. Oh, okay. Sorry for that one. Yeah, yeah. Lecture today. Yeah. So should should I start because I couldn't yeah. follow okay. what you were sorry saying. I'm sorry, <laughs> you were frozen. So I have no idea. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I uh, think this is working. Right, huh? Sorry yeah, for that okay. one. Can you see that one? Mm -hmm. Can yeah. you see that? Yeah. yeah. yeah so yeah. thank you for your invitation yeah. and for the introduction, yes, which I couldn't so follow. So I, I'll give you some Please words. Please start your presentation. Uh -huh. OK. So thank you for your invitation to this yeah. lecture series. And I'm deeply thankful that I could prepare for you what I'm talking about in the next minutes. It's a daunting to topic, it's difficult. So I'm glad I could work on it. Uh, before we start, I, let me say something about my professorship. I'm not at Humboldt University, as was suggested. I'm staying there as a visiting scholar at the moment and I will be back to technical university sooner or later. So within this week or the coming week or latest in December. So I'm proud to present to you. The topic gave me some headaches, I have to say. And um, Landung wanted me to speak about migration, environmental planning and gender. So I dived into that. And just to lower your expectations, uh, it's very slow. I'm sorry. I'm trying to. It's not working. Um, apologies. Hmm. Let me try another. Let me try if it works with. I'm sorry. Let me see if that works. Can you see that? No. Yes. Yeah, I but it, I cannot run through the uh, through the presentation, so that's a problem. Let me see. Oh, ma, ma, ma. Let me see. Maybe this one. Yeah, this one is working better. So you have to live with the left-hand side here. So just to lower your expectations, regarding the topic, we know less than we think or what you would expect to know about it. Um, I think environment, environmental planning must be understood in relation to climate change. We cannot do otherwise. Sustainability is in danger all over the world. 
And the gender dimension has been discussed, so everybody was talking about it, but in practice, it was neglected for a long time. So we have little research, we have work in progress, finally, and that is good. So what is the structure of my talk? I first want to give you some theoretical insights, then focus on the findings we have in the field, and then I want to um, draw your attention to the legacies of female activists, which are important to understand the setting we see today. Then I will talk about governance on migration and then come to the conclusions in about half an hour. So it's a rough program. And I built in uh, something which is not as academic as you would um, say to look on the legacies of female activists, because a main finding of my research for this presentation was that the activists, are, female activists are so important for the whole discourse on environment, environment planning. So, and I thought that's quite of stimulating also. So this is what we are going to do, please. It is slow. Let me see if that works. Yeah, so a bit of theory. Um, we are confronted with two big issues, two big challenges for environmental planning. And the two, which you can see here first as global issue, climate change. And that is a picture I took in the at the last climate change um, demonstration we had in Germany, which was huge in the end of October. So you see here the earth which is a grill, is <laughs> on the grill. And the next global issue is migration. So you see the worn out shoes here. And the two big, the two big topics, the two big challenges uh, for environmental planning are such big because they are both um, can be considered as wicked problems. So I'm not sure if you know the term, it's used in planning theory to describe a situation in which you have an issue which is entangled in different scales. So on the individual scale, on the local scale, urban scale, regional, national and global scale. And this multi-level governance is a characteristic because it's full of contradictory and rebellious logics for the different topics. So if you do one thing, it hurts the other, the other topic. So, and you never know exactly what is going on if you touch on one issue here and what this means for the other issue. Another um, characteristic of the, of the WIC problems is that there is no instant or standard solution in sight because we miss knowledge, because we don't know the situation, we didn't lift that situation. And we see, uh, last point, a mix of short-term and long-term processes which uh, play together. So we see, these two big challenges for environmental planning as wicked problems. We have knowledge in planning, so now it works. But planning, environmental planning is getting under pressure, why? What we saw over the past 20 years or with globalization, you could say even 30 years, um, is that cities are integrated, cities and towns also integrated into new, into new circuits of capital, goods and labor. So we have new mobilities of people, of course, of technologies, of knowledge, so ideas flowing around the globe, like my lecture now gives you insights, which are, of course, clearly Western dominated. And the knowledge I use is produced in, in, the Western, um, in Western countries. And your realities might be very different from what I see here. So um, knowledge is floating around the globe and um, the crisis, what is the crisis about? Because knowledge floating is not a problem, but the crisis is that we see within cities, formally integrated parts of the town, which are increasing, increasingly excluded or which fear inclusion. So the fear to become excluded is as strong as being excluded. And there's a need, of course, to integrate sustainable planning in the, in the next years. The reactions we see within planning, you know that, and you're students of planning. So let me just quickly show you what the traditional approaches towards planning issues are. Of course, you could, 
you could uh, refer to the built environment and you all know that master plans, you, you focus on buildings, on infrastructures, and very often you have flagship projects such as the center, the heritage, um, the, the rebuilding of the heritage in Semarang, for example, would be such an uh, concentration on the built environment. You can build um, infrastructure, watershed infrastructure. So all what is physical. This is one example for how planning works. Another example is the socioeconomic texture of the town. So you do labor market interventions, but you do also interventions in neighborhoods. So community development, for example, that is a very strong tool within planning. And you all know that a third dimension of planning or third approach or also dimension which uh, introduces certain tools is, is the symbolic and um, symbolics and narrations, the representation. So here the focus is on images, on narrations, on consume, on milieus, for example, who is living in parts of the town. And the best examples here are city marketing and branding. So you change the ideas we have about a place and you hope that this will lead to some form of um, development. Now, those are traditional um, tools, approaches we all know. But we have some newcomers. We have uh, not such old friends here. And those are the two you see on the right hand here, which is on mobilities and migrations. We do not know exactly, or cities do not know exactly how to deal with that, how to deal with a replacement, with dislocation, with refugees, with highly skilled who come, what to do with relocation. So this is all new. And what is also new is the gender. <laughs> The gender planning. I mean, I know there are big concerns. Is that important? Do we need that at all? Um, it totally, um, it is totally outside of traditional planning because traditional planning is rooted in a certain view on the world. And I will speak about that in a moment. And you will see that this gender blindness is having a strong impact on everything what is happening on the ground. So the tools we, we um, design are depending on the idea we have about planning. And if the idea about planning is gender neutral or gender blind, it's a big problem for the 50% for the of the population, which are women. So just to, just my main point here, we have traditional um, instruments, traditional strategies. And we have no real answer to work with the two newcomers here, mobilities and migration and gender related planning. So a bit of theory, I will first talk about climate change, I told you, and then about migration, just to, to see, to bring this together. So what are the current perspectives, perspectives on climate change? So normally we find literature that says, oh, climate change is a global problem. And uh, this is true, but it's only half of the truth or even less, maybe 20% of the truth. Uh, because um, we see manifest international asymmetries between the global north, the global south, for example, between developing countries and developed countries. We see local particularities, uh, so, so special situations like weather extremes are different for different places, rainfall pattern change differently. We see sea level rise, which for example is for Semarang a topic, or land subsidence, and so on. So we have local situations. Next, we have uh, different degrees of responsibilities, and this is often forgot that it is the, the industrial countries who um, are mainly responsible for the global warming. And it is mainly the countries of the global south which have to live with the consequences. So we have different responsibilities. It's not all about a global climate change, but it's also on certain ways of dominating the economy on extravism. And we have, most important point, different vulnerabilities among different groups of the population, depending on the regional setting. So if you have uh, flooding such as in Germany, the capacity to adapt is much higher as if you have this floodings every year or in a, in a, in a 
less uh, wealthy setting, of course. So you must speak about different situations. So you have different resources and possibilities of adaptation. If we speak about climate change, <clears throat> we must speak about the social and political, economical, the institutional structures which dominate on practices and norms also. And all those imply a gender dimension. And if we do not um, address this, we risk to be gender blind and all our answers will not function well. So what are findings? What may I present you about findings in the literature on the gender dimension? Let me just give you some examples. And this is relating on the work which recently came out by Mrs. Bauriedl. She's a professor in Flensburg University. And she said, it's good to, um, to see the causes, the consequences, reactions and solutions. So she says, for example, if we measure um, who is um, responsible for a large share of um, emissions, it is normally very wealthy um, households. So higher incomes correlate with higher emissions per person, if you want to measure this, if you want to count. And then she says what I said before, on a global scale differences, there are differences between the global north and the global south. But on a smaller scale, we see mobilities and consume, consume style, lifestyles that differ for gender. And those are tied to norms, resources, and access. She says, and this is an important point, women own less soil, less grounds, and less means of production also. So they have fewer access to resources in total, and they have less impact on the way the land is used, how things are produced. She says there are consequences. So we see that extreme weather events often hit women, hit women more often, especially so in regions where women have a low status. We have no, no systematic research about that, but we have anecdotal evidence that this is the case. Women have less access to information and women have different mobility pattern. They are often not allowed to move alone on their own. They, they need to be accompanied by a brother, a male person, <laughs> a brother, a husband, or a father whatsoever. Um, there are direct and indirect consequences. So um, women often take care of family duties. So they are, not, um, they are taking care of others, not of themselves. And we know that in dry seasons, women and girls are responsible to find water and woods, and they it takes more energies to cope with that if you have less water and uh, the, the country, the, the land is dry. For Europe, we know that heat waves, we do not know why, but heat waves normally have a higher impact on women, on elder and poor, poor women in neighborhoods with heat stress than men. So this is one thing we can say, which is a bit astonishing for me, at least. I didn't think of gender differences here. But this is, of course, some ignorance. So when it comes to reaction and solutions, and here we have to, to, to be aware that um, climate change is treated increasingly or is treated as a security and science problem. So the solutions are thought in a technological and market dominated way. And those are classically male professions. So it's about wind energies, for example, in Germany, engineering, and here we have, I do not know about your country, but we have mainly male, um, male persons working in that field. But we often, um, women dominated sectors of the economy are not part of the research agenda. For example, care is not in the focus here. And um, also she says that feminist research itself, we could think that feminist research is addressing climate change issues. It is not, um, and that is a problem because it, there's a difficulty to judge others as victims of something. So if I say climate change hits more frequently women, you could also say you victimize the women. And this is the last thing we want to do, right? So, um, and we have up to now, and I hope this is changing because I consider this is really a key topic. 
We have little discourse in the universities. We have much more discourse in policies. So we have to, I had to step back to understand what is going on to policies, even though I think academics and science is, has to keep away from politics in a way because we have to be independent. But in that case, we have to understand what's going on. So I was checking if there's an example um, also for, for Indonesia on this climate um, gender differences. And I found one, which is a tsunami in Aceh in 2004, where four times as often women than men were killed because they could not swim, they could not run due to the tight clothing. Women were in the house and were warned lately. Um, and they had to take care of the children and elderly. So this is a clear difference for men and women. And you find such differences regarding the agriculture, the way we, um, we raise um, foods and crops, biodiversity, of course, health and migration. And I introduced here, I, I, I put in this picture here of this climate justice activist because I first could make no sense out of why we have all that fuss about climate justice. But it is exactly the point because there is little awareness of how important the topic is. So um, it is those women who are activists who just lay the grounds to, to find new ways to deal with um, climate change. And this is why I want to bring you in the next five minutes or so to important female protagonists of the, of the climate uh, change discussion, which are normal for us today. Let me show you what happened. So we need to look on the legacies. Women were always activists of the environmental change, sustainability um, movements. And that is so important that we have here for the first time a gender specific view. This up to today often considered a luxury that we, we consider also the situation of women. It is not, it, it's, it's absolutely needed. And it's been a long battle. <laughs> it's been a battle that stopped for many years as I noticed then uh, of women to be mentioned. And I, I give you some examples how long it takes until an idea becomes uh, a normality. See, for example, you have here, excuse me. So you can see here, Rachel Carson. I'm, I'm not sure if you know that name, but she's been the first woman that uh, openly opponed against um, pesticides. So uh, especially the DDT, we call it, which is uh, highly, uh, which is a poison <laughs> in a way, which was used for the for the crops for the uh, for the grain. And after her protest, her book was the Silent Spring. Um, after her protest, this pesticide has been forbidden, at least in the USA and Germany. In many other countries, it's still in use. I, I do not know about Indonesia, by the way. I wondered, but she was an activist. And, and her knowledge was then, after a long time, introduced into policies. And today, of course, we discuss with more, um, we are more careful about the pesticides, of course, because we know it produces also cancer in, in human bodies. Next one, a bit off the track, but still important. This is Jane Jacobs, and she was the woman opposing the, um, the strategy of the car-friendly city. So tearing, tearing down old organically grown neighborhoods with a mix of work and life and women all over the place. And um, she, she stated that exactly the mix is important for women because they can move freely because others are around while the idea of Robert Moses, which was one of the leading arch architects in New York City, um, introducing the car friendly city. Uh, he said that it's better to have clean parks and, and, and uh, spacious um, highways. And, and she said, well, th there's nothing safe about a park because you need to have people around to be uh, in, a, in a safe neighborhood. So she destroyed with her ideas, 
the, the idea of the car centric planning ideology, which was behind, which was putting bridges and highways all over the place. And she said, we need, um, we, we need more livable mixed neighborhoods. And this is an idea which goes in that direction also. And next one I found, which I think is important for us if we think about gender and climate change, are uh, those two, and they're both pretty old, and I don't think it's, it's, um, it's, um, I, I think it's, we, we have a lack now for the past years to work on, on that topics. And here you see Vananda Shiva and Maria Mies, and they worked against, or uh, Vananda Shiva first against the Green Revol Revolution, so against the pesticides and seeds that are owned by big enterprises, you know that. And in uh, 93, she came up with that lady on the right. She's a, is a, she's a researcher from, from Cologne in Germany. Uh, they put up something called ecofeminism. So they put women and ecology in the center of development planning, and that is important. So relating, um, they said that, that the destruction and extraction of the nature is a male-dominated idea and thinking in terms of money and not in terms of sustainability. So those were again women. And by the way, I, I threw this out due to time reasons, time restrictions. Uh, after the Chernobyl event, after the, the blow up of the nuclear uh, plant in, in Ukraine um, in 87, it was mainly women who were activists and said, we cannot live with that. We, we have to get away from the nuclear power. And um, that is a similar movement. A last one for you, or a nearly last one is this one. There's Vangara Matai. Uh, she, she was the founder of the of a today worldwide movement, which is the uh, Green Belt movement. And she said, we have to plant trees, we have to do that. In the beginning, everybody said, this is ridiculous. Uh, I'm, but now it's, it's a real movement and the MacArthur Foundation is funding here. And uh, I think it's another grasswood action on preserving nature. And now I come to my last slide about the strong women or important legacies of women, and you all know them. And you can be ambivalent about it. And I have here on the right hand, Mrs. Greta Thunberg, a, a young lady, very young lady, um, uh, who says, I want you to panic. So she wants, she urges the world to do something. And here on the other hand, you see this picture I took uh, at the same demonstration with the grilled earth. Um, it is an old lady and she stands up, it says grandmothers for future. So she says, oh, I'm part of this movement for the next generations. And here again, you have women activists. And now the point is not that they're female, but the point is um, what they have in common when they think about the way we treat the world. And they say what they all have is that they criticize, excuse me, it was, Mm -hmm. that they criticize the way um, economics think. And they say that science for the moment concentrates on one sector or one aspect. And this is not what we need. We need interdisciplinary oriented problem solving science, which takes the problem and comes from different angles. They say that research is often concentrating on one point in time but we must include the long midterm or long-term perspective. And you know that, excuse me, you know that from uh, research that you have policy near research and they ask you, yeah, just let us know what we have to do. And you say, I cannot, and, and you as a researcher try to explain that you can't come up with a deeply or with a real research within two months or so to resolve a problem for the next half year. but that we must look more long-term, uh, hopefully research can do that. So we, at the moment we have also the, the point that we cannot understand the structural reasons for non-change. So we all know that change would be appropriate transformation, but it's very, very slow. And we, we just do not understand really why is this so. Then a next point they have in common they, um, they look at 
consumer oriented lifestyles um, that might be individual, but the question must be for planning how to organize cities, how to organize mobilities, which and which root causes are tied to patriarchal forms of social organization. So how goes that together? And we just do not know at the moment because we oversaw that for the past years. And you, you already noticed I became in the past weeks when I was preparing this talk, I became really angry because we know so little. And um, we have to get away. And this is a message all the women told us. Um, that we have to get away from the technology tied uh, views. So techno fixes, geoengineering, smart cities, efficiency as a gold standard is uh, to be questioned at least. So um, certainly we do not find technological solutions for social problems. And we have to realize that. Next point, uh, the promises of digital, digital technologies. Uh, it is today private companies, not states, which increasingly decide on urban futures and participation. Does it really help us to overcome climate change? And then um, an example for mobilities, all the tools for sharing, sharing mobilities we have in the Western cities, such as Berlin, where, I'm, where I am now, they are mainly designed for people, often young men, it, it's it's uh, concepts which are good for leisure time, but not uh, for daily use. So it's the last mile and the last mile thinking is normally not adapted to households, household needs. But this is just a little point. So this is about the theory, the thinking about the problems on climate change. I want to um, come to the governance issues, which are tied to the activists. And this is why I showed you the activists. It's, it's important to have a look here on what activists say. What came out of this activism is that we have the um, sustainable, sustainable Development Goals. You know that goal five is on gender. So on, on gen, achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. And we have at least we have a gender action plan now within the climate change process. And this is the Lima work program on gender. And I was just checking for us the different prior priority areas. You can see that here in the priority areas. And um, I will introduce you to such areas. We have this five areas of the gender action plan. We have uh, further as part of the plan, gender responsive climate finance. So we go to the budgeting for women. That is interesting. And we have since two years, since 2019, always with a corona break inside. Uh, I would say, yeah, it slowed down everything. We have national climate change and gender focal points. So just let me flip through that because um, I was astonished we have that. And um, so it's all about capacity building, capacity building, strengthen the evidence base. So we do not know so much. That's what they say. It's about collecting, analyzing, apply sex dis disaggregated data and gender analysis in the context of climate change. So we don't have it. And please see here, um, this is to, to, to happen until 2024. So most of the goals described here are looking on a time period or time span of five years or so. So um, yeah, we are just at the starting point. And then of course, important social media reaching out particularly to women. And next area is the gender balance, participation, women's leadership. So to help women to get into the position to speak for their own. And for that, uh, there's a need for travel funds. You might think that is ridiculous, but it is not. We see that women, are, if you see the, the conference in Glasgow, you have less women there. And normally women have at least the hope that they will speak for women, while men just 
um, speak for themselves often. So travel funds, and then you hear you have a point which might be connected to the activists, bring in local communities and indigenous people um, to, um, to have their knowledge, to have their views also. And this is because why legacy is so important because all those ideas had to be developed before. Next one, coherence. And here you see that what I hope to find to present you and what you hope to hear from me is not yet existing. We don't have a consistent and systematic manner in which gender related um, knowledge and mandates are one. So we are still on the way to that. And yeah, there should be a guarantee that the reports are also considered by the in the in the in the overall process. And then um, am I running out of time? Landung? No, I have still 10 to 15 minutes, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we should strengthen the coordination between the work on gender considerations, yeah? And also with the SDG, you see that here. So, and that should have, should have been done until past year. I couldn't find any more recent um, information on that. And that is interesting, as you will see in a moment. The next area is gender responsive implementation and means of implementation. And here you see what I was addressing before. Gender budgeting would be one way to achieve that goal. So you have uh, funding allocated to do certain things which are um, pointing to gender issues. And then the overall idea to uh, strengthen the gender integration into climate policies, plans, strategies, and action. And of course, gender responsive technological solutions. So as I told you, many of the solutions such as geoengineering and so on are male dominated in a way. And we need the indigenous and traditional knowledge to, to have a fully fledged agenda for climate, climate transformation, I would say. Mm -hmm. So, and then it's also, as you can see here, exchange information, okay? In brackets, you always see when the goal has to be reached and it's all in the long run. So next area is monitoring and reporting. Yeah, that is clear that you need some form of, um, of reporting to guarantee that people are working on that. And I think that that is exciting. We have this plan, I, I haven't heard about that before. And the next one, so the gender responsive climate finance. Here's the hope to involve more women which are, which are implementing than gender friendly solutions. And there's the need to integrate gender experts, at least persons who have a, who do not turn a blind spot to gender questions. And it's a request to have women that should sit on the table where decisions are made. So loans and grants, which go directly to women. And then there's a nice, <laughs> there's a nice request to fund climate activists that they can act as a change maker. I'm not so sure if that is a good idea, but I thought it was interesting that they think at least to give some compensation for that people who engage, that women who engage, because engagement always costs time and resources and we all know that. So um, next one, the, I was astonished. We have national climate change and gender focal points. Did you know? Um, so um, these are points where climate negotiations, implementation and monitoring should be done. And that is interesting um, because in every country we have different institutional arrangements and what is brought together here are two separate areas of work. So it will be difficult to bring together the knowledge, the people across different ministries, departments and agencies, short MDA, which normally do not speak to each other. So that is it's a fully new approach. It can work out, but it must not necessarily so. And then I, I gave a final polish to my talk yesterday and I noticed that yesterday, did you know, at COP27, there was the Gender and Science Innovation Day. And this is the way how, 
how gender is implemented into, into the broader policy agenda. And so I flipped through this Gender and Science and Innovation Day, 9th November. I was unable to, to, um, to link into the, the process, but I checked the program. And the only point that was left in the program on gender was this sentence here on uh, the coalition of feminist action for climate justice and the UFCCC gender action plan. So the plan as a whole is discussed and you have again the activists coming in and here it is the feminist activists, which I mean, is interesting. And in all the West was dedicated to, to science innovation and totally different things. So here, we, we can see that the gender topic is, is misused also in a way. Okay, this is all about climate change. I will quickly come now to migration, why I think there must be a gender agenda also for migration. What are facts and trends and what are the gender dimensions? Why is it important? And here I'll be quick. It's important to realize, first of all, that if we look on key trends in international migration, that um, nearly half of all migrants, international migrants, are women. And so 47.9% uh, and um, this is, I think, important information among other key figures you can see, uh, key trends you can see here. So um, what do we know about gender with migration? So it's only international migration, which is already a privileged form of migration often. So the, 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 the biggest share of migrations is internal migration. And here women will be even more present. So what do we know about the gender dimension of migration? We have, and I will show you that in a moment, we have a very different participation of women in internal and international migration. We have missing data stocks, which differentiate for gender and sex. I mean, this is migration data is always difficult because it's tied to national counting systems and you can hardly compare that. So, but we know that women in general have a lower visibility compared to men because they do not stand in the first, in the first uh, line or they, 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 they are not, they do not speak out as loud as men do often, which doesn't mean they are not as important. And women are more vulnerable, we can say so, because they often, I say often, not always, have a lower educational and social status in many parts of the world. They have to act within gender specific norms, which are often um, oppressing them. They have less financial and material resources, so they cannot act as, as men can do. They cannot pay for the travel, for example. And uh, they, they become more easily subjects of physical violence in the migration process. Yeah? This is also an important point that women are uh, put um, under control through violence. So I want to show you the share, the percentage of women in international migration. And here, here you can see the national and the regional differences you cannot see, but you can imagine there are many differences. And this is the most recent data from 2019. And you can see that you have certain countries which have um, more than 55% of uh, women, as especially here in Eastern Europe, women which are part of the migration population. And we wouldn't think that. So I thought it's important to show you that. We have um, different numbers of female migrants in international migration, if you look on the area of destination. And here again, you can see that women outnumber men in parts of the global north, and they are in, on the increase in the global south. You can see here that from 1990, the number of women in Northern and Western Africa is increasing. It is it's the same for Central and Southern Asia, for example. You can see that here, that there's a bit of, of change in it. The biggest increase is here in Africa and uh, Europe and uh, Northern America has, has more women 
than men in international mobilities. This means that we must understand immobilities much more than we do at the moment. We have, as I told you, often no gendered data on diasporas. For example, we, we just do not know the diaspora of how many men and women does it consist. And it means that women have less voice in this transnational power play also. And I just brought you this very nice picture, this nice diagram, which looks like a, like a woven <laughs> something um, on which groups uh, of migrants are active internationally. And initially, and you can see it is the Russian Federation. It is Mexico, for example, where you can think of many women being active, but we don't know the Russian Federation, China, of course. So um, women have less voice. That's my point here. And then I was checking some more research, recent research, which takes the gender perspective into the research design. And we have some of those. And this is often called intersectional research that has started. And here the focus is on immobilities. And here I show you how this group of scientists with all sorts of um, academics from all over the world has tried to understand why there are immobilities and who is becoming active. And here you can say without telling you exactly the results, if you start to differentiate, you see absolutely differences on men and women who migrate or stay in place. And I think that those are interesting findings, interesting um, new approaches. I'll give you some of the findings of that work. They, they, this group says, and it came out just a month ago or so. They say that wealthier and better connected households may be more likely to migrate than their poorer counterparts. And this is why we have to think about immobilities also because it can become a trap and it's a trap for a certain part of the population. They say that the ability to migrate is influenced by a wide range of intersecting social factors and life course transitions, gender, age, caste, ethnicity, formal education, social networks, marital status within the same household. So all the accounting of the new economics of labor migration wouldn't apply because we do not know the black box of the household who is concerned of which um, dynamics. And then in total, they say there are a variety of reasons for those, these trends, including cultural norms that restrict female mobility and privilege male mobility, related caregiving responsibilities in the household and household composition. And I thought this was exactly the, the crucial point. So you have not only restrictions, restrictions on female mobility, you have also privileges for the man, for the male mobility. And that is always difficult to tackle because nobody is giving away privileges. No, we all know that. And um, we must think also about situations where migration is not a preferred option, which is often the case. I come to my conclusions because I'm running out of time, I know. Um, I think if we look on mobility research, mobilities research, we must explore much more the connections between mobility and the intervening social factors and prevent mobility for some, for some. So we must see what is the outcome in the source and house community for all. And mobility is not an option for everyone. The role of gender education and other social factors that determine mobility and immobility. And I need, in, in the end, environmental planning is in need of more gendered research exactly on who is moving and not, and what does it mean for planning to have tailored planning solutions also. But all that is a very long way to go, as you have seen with many obstacles in the way. So. Uh, let me thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to the, to the discussion and you can see here that woman that is having a long way to find water for her family and due to climate change even more so in the 
future. Let me thank you for your attention. And let me, if I may, draw your attention to that conference we are having in Berlin next year. And I hope to see many of you there. And um, we will speak about that in a, in a moment, maybe also. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Fasolicitas, for your speech. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I deeply apologize for my technical problem in the beginning. I forgot, uh, not forget, I missed the chance to introduce you to the audience. So, so the audience, uh, we just uh, got the speech from Professor Felicita Hilman. She is the professor from uh, Frey University, Berlin, from the Department of Geoscience. Is that right? No, 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 it's not. I've been at Free University to do my habilitation and then I switched to Technical University, Berlin. Oh, okay. And I'm yeah. now a visiting scholar at Humboldt University, but I'll be back at Technical University soon. So I, I mean, okay. it's a life of an academic, which is a migrant life in a way. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the uh, confirmations. So, uh, yes, uh, Professor Felicitas uh, has a lot of uh, academic records. Uh, she has appointed as a peer review for the journal, for the books, and also the editorial board for the several uh, journals, and uh, also has uh, taken a role as a I would call it the, 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 your professorship from several uh, international universities. So, yeah. So, we, we are very lucky to get a Professor Felicitas uh, this afternoon. And once again, thank you very much for your speech. It's very interesting about migration, environmental planning, and gender. You address the challenges in the environmental planning, particularly for the uh, about the consequence for the for the different groups of inhabitants, particularly in the women, and you uh, give some example of the rule of the significant rules of the women in the uh, yeah in dealing with climate change and the critics for the non-sustainable planning. So, mm. and you also address the some policy consequence of the uh, the gender issue related to gender action plan and also the uh, related to the how to integrate gender in the broader uh, research and uh, policy agenda is not only uh, stop in the research uh, in the university and also in the last point you address about the uh, the facts about the migrations and the voice of the woman that is uh, still limited. So thank you very much for your presentations. And I'm sure that the audience has a lot of critical questions and uh, because of your, your presentation is very interesting. I will give uh, the, the, the chance for the, for the audience to uh, ask you some questions, but may, later after we hear the yeah, presentation yeah. from uh, Bulando. Okay, is that okay for you? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so the audience will have a chance to list their questions. Okay, so uh, the, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and we will have uh, the second uh, speaker here, Ibu Landung. Ibu Landung is uh, our uh, lecturer, and uh, actually, she's um, yeah, she graduated from our university and she got a master's degree from the University on Queensland and her research interest on the, wait a minute. <laughs> yes, yeah, about the gender and uh, about uh, social housing, poverty alleviations, and then property management. And yeah, she's now focusing more on the gender-based urban management. So, Ibu Landu, we will give you about 30 to 40 minutes to present uh, your speech. Uh, yeah, time and screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the time. Uh, Bumaya, can you hear my voice clear? 
Yes, it's very clear. Please. And also the power power presentation? Not yet. It's still on your uh, explorer. Really? Wait a minute. I will try to share once again. It's still in the Explorer? No. Can you see? Not yet, still in the Explorer. Open the document. Uh, do you want Intan to help you, Lando? Oh, yeah, it's good now. Ah, herzlichen Dank. <laughs> okay. Yeah, please, Bulano. Can you see now? Yes. I'm sorry for the technical. Yes, we can see. OK, uh, my PowerPoint presentation? Yeah. OK. Uh, in that, is it in SlideShow or in already in SlideShow? If you go on the, on the small um, symbol, yeah, yeah I exactly. I, I have. <laughs> Wait a minute. Um, yeah. I think I will ask Intan to help me to share from your computer. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I send you by WhatsApp, Intan. Have you received? Maybe Landung, uh, it doesn't work as a full screen. I had the same problem. So maybe you just give it a try with the smaller one. Thank you very much, Intan, for the help. Yeah, um, I have a bit of technical difficulties here because I use other computers, not my regular uh, laptops. Yeah, so yeah, I need uh, some <laughs> adaptation. Okay, thank you very much for the time, Bumaya, and thank you also for the enthusiasm for all the audience. Uh, until now, we still have 182 participants. Yeah, join uh, the room. So. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone's still in healthy condition, safe and sound, and also assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, my presentation today um, actually is part of my dissertation research, um, but still in the beginning uh, uh, process, yeah? So in the beginning steps. And today I would like to give uh, the presentation with the title, Residential Mobility Decision, of urban poor household of Semarang City. Next, um, my outline consists of four uh, sections, uh, for research background, and then residential mobility decision influence factor. Uh, we have uh, three findings and then conclusion. Um, let me start with the research background. So since 2015 in Semarang City, the local government uh, implemented um, 
PSPS, uh, Bantuan Stimulan perum Perumahan Swadaya, or we call uh, Self-Help Housing Stimulan Assistance Programs. And the main objective is actually to reduce urban poverty. But uh, the implementation uh, of um, PSPS by giving a small amount of money for urban poor to help them renovate them their house and improving physical condition of the houses. Um, the fact that um, gender mainstreaming strategy must be implemented into program implementation has enabled the local government um, from Semarang City to integrate a gender mainstreaming policy to BSPS implementation. So um, as a requirement, the beneficiaries of the program should also target it women. And the selection of the recipients uh, were conducted via several discussion and several steps. Um, for example, they have, uh, they held and gather all the village uh, stakeholders and to do the village mapping, they have map to uh, locate uh, which household are poor than others. And also they have several focus group, focus group discussion. And the other instruments to select the recipients is to calculate it, uh, the percentage of poor household distribution in its municipalities. So basically, the higher the poor household numbers in the municipality, then the uh, assistance program will be given higher or bigger. Uh, why uh, gender mainstreaming is important in implementation of PSPS program? Because government, the national government, believe that gender mainstreaming uh, um, assure that effectiveness of the program implementation was established. Uh, why? Because gender mainstreaming uh, basically looking for aspect in the program implementation. So they uh, ask the respond respondents, uh, the recipients, the beneficiaries, how is the program, as uh, how is the access to the program? What about their participation? And then the benefit of the program and then how they can control the program output. Next. Um, from the statistic uh, that we gather from the primary surveys conducted in September 2020, most of the respondent coined uh, three major answer for the implementation of the fund that were given by the, by the government. So the first priority is to renovate the roof, the ceiling, uh, second to renovate the wall, and then the last one to renovate the floor. Next. And uh, my primary surface also asked them actually how they perceive their ideal house and environment definition. Um, in regards to the perception of house definition for them, health is the number one priority for the family member. Um, maybe it is because also the influence of the COVID-19 pandemic that uh, now everyone put health as the top priority of everything. And then uh, the second, the use of house for family upbringing and also uh, a house can secure a family tenure. And we also ask them uh, on their perception, their expectation of ideal neighborhood. Um, the first priority is uh, quite shocking that they say that for them, uh, ideal environment is that their life uh, livelihood should be free from periodic flood or other disaster. Uh, I can show you later on from the map. And then second, uh, safe from family, uh, safe from criminal activities. And then the third, um, my neighborhood should have amenities or other supporting facilities. Um, our research location consists of five municipalities. Uh, you can see at the number from the picture, uh, from the map that uh, number one uh, is in North Semarang, number two in West Semarang, 
number three in Kendu, number four Pedurungan, and number five Gunung Pati. Each of them uh, represent the locational characteristics. So number one and number two, um, we want to target uh, the municipalities that have relation, uh, locational relationship with the CBDs. And number three and number four represents the location of houses that are uh, listed in very, very areas of Eastern Semarang cities. And then number five, um, we want to reflect the characteristic of uh, intersection between urban and rural, or we call it urban village, uh, Kampung Kota. Um, next. So based on their answer, we come up with a question. If housing physical condition was, is upgraded, um, are they have motivation to still stay in the neighborhood or they want to move from their uh, poor neighborhood? Um, and th then we uh, came up with a research scope and we uh, depicted the definition of residential mobility. Um, it's quite uh, different with other uh, residential mobility definitions. So the research um, focus on the definition and ask uh, and give choices to the household members. Are they want or willing to move out and they find or uh, achieve their perceived ideal house and environmental? Uh, this is based on Huang et al. 2019. And then um, after we come up from this research scope, we have another uh, question. Uh, we want to uh, look over, uh, investigate, what are factors influence the decision? Is gender uh, relation, uh, maybe it's not only gender relation, the gender role also influences the decision. So we come up uh, this, Research with two preliminary questions. Are they want to move or not? And then what are the decision factors that influence them? Next. Um, to have a great uh, description about the study location, uh, I'm not giving you all the details uh, attribute uh, of the respondents, but only three major uh, determinants of the uh, definition. First, that uh, you can see from the uh, chart, the source of income of almost uh, respondents, all the respondents uh, are in an informal sector. 42% uh, of respondents works in informal sectors, followed by uh, they are not working is uh, uh, quite higher, 31%, and then followed by uh, the household that work in formal sector 27%. And looking at the home ownership status, we can see that the majority of the home ownership is of self-owned. So it uh, legitimate uh, for them that they have their own house. And uh, the rest of them, 16%, belong to the parents. So maybe they got it from the inheritance. The last 3% divided into two categories. Uh, the blue one, the, um, the, they live or they occupy the house that are belong to the children. And then they also occupy the house that are belong to the extended family. Um, looking at the house area, most of the respondents uh, occupy a quiet small house area, less than 50 square meter, uh, approximately 66%. And the least one, 8% uh, uh, rains in 101 until, uh, yeah, 101 until 150 square meter. And in the middle, 36% lives in a house with uh, 51 until 100 square meters. So um, we can see that from this uh, description that most of them are working in informal sectors, they uh, own their house and then they live in um, less than 50%, uh, 50 square meters of house area. Next. Uh, finding number one, uh, from the answer of the respondent, 
90% of them uh, just to stay. It is quite surprising, uh, despite their deprived house and environment condition, they eager to stay at their uh, remain a neighborhood. Uh, why? Because they have locational attachment to the site. Um, what makes them um, more um, ha, um, more uh, bonded with the location is because the location provides livelihood. And then the second one, because in the number five in the area of Gunung Pati, Gunung Pati municipalities, the location is specific and suitable for farmers and cattle mines. Uh, I can show you from the map, the picture after this, please. Okay, um, the respondent lives in uh, West Semarang and in North Semarang, uh, reflected by number one and number two, um, shows that they have more than one informal uh, work, informal sectors work. So um, they have high dependency to the urban areas for income earning activities. For example, uh, school police and then parking lots operators, security, and also the, uh, all of them that uh, work at a traditional food store or other informal works activities that rely on uh, mobility of the people. And then um, the respondent who lives in the num uh, in Kukenu and Pedurungan, reflected with number three and four, uh, as he live in the very, very area, they are uh, highly um, dependent on the using of their home as home-based enterprises. So not only as a security of tenor, the house function as uh, the place for uh, doing economic activities and help uh, them to uh, improve their family subsistence. And then, as I told you before, uh, the last one in the Gunung Pati area municipalities, most of them are working as a farmers and um, as a cattleman. So it is because of the uh, characteristic of the location that give them uh, expectation and hope for the livelihood. Uh, they have a uh, secure livelihood from the relationship from home activities to the work location. Next. Okay, finding number two. When, when they are given a choice to move, um, the answer recorded that most of them want to move out from the dreamy neighborhood because of they want to have more qualified house or more access uh, to um, more better access to public facilities. This is also uh, in line with Huang et al's statement. Yeah? Uh, why this happened? Because um, uh, looking at their uh, uh, answer, they uh, mentioned that home upgrading activities connect them, connect uh, the household uh, in community level. Um, this is also in line with uh, the statement from William 2005, Glasson and Schuler 2011, and Moser 2017. Um, what makes them uh, have a strong connection between a village member or municipalities member? Because they have stronger, uh, stronger kinship uh, in between them. So the ability to be heard the ability that they need help from them and the feeling of uh, having the same experience makes them stronger. And then the second one, uh, the availability of social networks. So no matter what happens uh, in the family, uh, in the community member, uh, they can always rely on each other. Um, they share uh, the same experiences. So in terms of uh, opportunity given, the structure, the um, family structure also, and then a gender relationship, they share the same experiences. Um, this makes them, uh, next. Um, this makes them um, 
feeling empowered. So as you can see from the picture, um, the household member, women, men, young and old uh, have their participation and contribution uh, being acknowledged. Um, there if uh, they have uh, how do you call it uh, the room for exchange information they share their ideas their opinion they want to be hit, to be heard and then they have uh, uh, instruments uh, to to deliver this kind of uh, ideas and opinions not only that but they also have a traditional and cultural a context that makes them even more stronger because uh, one of the requirements of the PS, uh, PSPS program implementation is that they should uh, work uh, together to construct the house. So the amount of money given by the government should not be spent for paying uh, for labor costs. So it should be uh, spent for buying construction material expenditures. You can see from the picture, maybe it's uh, quite uh, only, only male uh, uh, participation, yeah? But we can see here that um, they can always uh, ask for their neighbor to help them to grow stronger and grow together. Next. This has led to uh, finding number T. Uh, that uh, actually or uh, the impression from the home improvement activities has encouraged them to uh, have participation. And this participation uh, then leads to the empowerment that uh, grow in uh, individual and the, in the household level. In the individual level, um, gender participation um, calculated, estimated that gender roles and gender relation influence the socially constructed distribution and use of resources of household. So they talk to each other, they decided something, they discuss on how um, several roles in uh, household and community member uh, in community level should be um, taken into account. And from this point of view, uh, the more dominant uh, features that come up from the gender participation is that gender relation um, really uh, plays significant function in participation and decision making for family subsistence. Uh, next, in a household level, um, the ability to understand that they have uh, a, a choice and opportunity to get a better uh, um, condition, um, increase individual capacity building. And in a collective level, in household level, this means that they have ability to perform as agent of change. According to Narayan, it's also uh, depicted from the location that household assets and capabilities are influenced by social capital. As I uh, mentioned before from the picture and also from the explanation that um, maybe uh, uh, from, from our point of view, this is simple, but um, the media for having information sharing, feeling of acceptance to be heard, to be acknowledged, um, make them um, um, in a better, uh, in a better uh, condition. Um, makes them empower them that they can do more. And then positioning in the family is also important because um, um, Felicitas also mentioned before in the presentation that most of the unpaid works uh, distribution uh, of uh, women labor in a household chores is not recognized. So um, the process and um, long awareness to recognize to um, acknowledge that women actually can do participate, can have a decision and normally because they, in general, in general that because they spend most of their time inside and outside the houses itself, makes them has the um, 
effective strategy to move out from the condition of depreciation. Next. So we come to the conclusion that 90% um, of the respondents from five municipalities in regards with their condition of home deprivation and poor household, um, they choose to stay. And the major contribution is because they have locational attachment. I said before, the livelihood is the most important thing from them, for them. And um, in order to do the home improvement as a output from a BSPS implementation program, they have varieties of uh, activities and um, the activities is driven by cultural context and socioeconomic characteristic. And then they have empowered the themselves uh, look, uh, um, with a gender uh, relationship uh, performance. And for them, 10% uh, who decided to move uh, because they have a uh, lack of um, choices. Um, the majority of them want to have a more qualified home and in a new location uh, because they want to have a more um, uh, security of tenure. So, they want to have their house as for themselves, and then they will have an uh, increased um, function of the house for the family subsystem. Um, this is also the same with the reason why they want to stay, actually, because they're looking at the livelihood guarantee. So um, they're eager to move as long as their uh, income before location um is uh, projected the same with the income from after location so um looking at this uh conclusion i try to recommend some policy implement uh implication next um this is quiet um actually this is not not new yeah that governments governance should see housing as a collective asset and not as an investment tool so um, in order to do that, um, we should understand um, policymaker, government, local government, and maybe a private sector should understand that housing should serve as community development instrument. Um, uh, the process of housing improvement help them to have uh, increased capac uh, individual capacity building. Um, this means that um, from the gender point of view, uh, every uh, policy implementation, every design, every planning should be um, taken into account that governments should have a specific intervention. Um, for example, from people who want to move, um, maybe they should have a targeted relocation not only from the government perspective, for example, okay, I want, I, I can relocate you in the very, very area, uh, low uh, land value, but I cannot guarantee that you will have the same income as uh, before location. So specific intervention to this uh, marginalized group uh, for them is important. And then uh, second one, um, the most important is that to solve the problem by um, giving response to the problem. The location is important and the location is not a problem. The problem is that um, the housing improvement should be uh, doing in a process. So uh, for them, um, choices to move out from this uh, poor neighborhood is impossible. Um, the effective way is let them stay and then help them also to uh, exert uh, their potential uh, uh, by looking at uh, specific uh, factors that influence. And the most important thing is that doing collaboration. Um, next, uh, my last presentation. So when we look at the livelihood asset, we understand uh, the five aspects contributed uh, mainly for the um, decision of how far we could uh, influence the livelihood asset. 
But by looking at this case study, we see that human capital and social capital are more profound. Yeah. So um, skill, knowledge, labor, and also good health should be also included in human capital, not only uh, looking at the um, household by, for example, educational level, income level, uh, family structure, but we should also um, acknowledge, include, integrate this definition. And then looking at the social capital, sometimes we uh, forgot or neglected and ignore this um, aspect. Um, generally, social resources, networks, affiliation, and social re reflection that help them grow. So um, government should give a opportunity structure to the uh, respondent in the case study, for example, as a case study, to uh, give them access and to give them more uh, uh, more time for, con for contribution and participation in any level, not only in, in household, but also in a community level. And uh, sometimes also by looking at the livelihood asset, especially from physical capital and also natural capital, we look only for the, um, how do you call it? Uh, from the um, nature um, characteristic or definition, for example, the, uh, uh, the contribution, the land uh, suitability, but we should also uh, look at the location attachment, the relationship between uh, the house and other location, especially the work location that uh, help them to um, do the uh, mobility from home to the location. So it's mean that we should look at the activities pattern in the location area, uh, in the area, not only from the uh, to uh, two ways or to definition of the natural capital and physical capital, but also looking at the uh, spa uh, spatial reproduction from the um, characteristic of activities pattern. So I think uh, that's all from uh, my presentation. Um, this is quite a local context. Uh, we can see from uh, Professor Felicitas presentation that she look uh, more on uh, international and uh, national context, but this is more on a special and local context. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Harrison Dang for your uh, from of Mark Sam Skype. Uh, Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you very much, Bulando, for the uh, very interesting uh, presentations about residential mobility decisions, uh, particularly for the urban poor households. So, uh, if I may uh, make some summary, this uh, Bulando is based on her uh, Bulando presentation is about the uh, research on the common uh, phenomena in the urban area. There's a lot of uh, poor neighborhoods and uh, the choices of the inhabitants, whether they want to move or to stay. And then uh, she also addressed about uh, some implication related to the decision, the inhabitant decisions, uh, partic particularly to improve the uh, housing conditions and um, the, there's also finding about the gender participation on the housing improvement. So at the end, uh, Bu Lando also addressed some policy implication to ensure uh, that the strategies of the government need to address the livelihood uh, strategy of the inhabitant and also to integrate uh, gender issue in the development. Okay, thank you very much for the very interesting uh, presentation, Bulando. And uh, I think so the, the participants uh, will have a, a lot of critical questions for both of the speakers today. Okay, uh, before I give the, the uh, yeah, before I give the chance to the participant to raise their questions, I will give the opportunity for the Professor uh, Wiwandari Buiwi. Do you want to address something? 
or do you want to uh, give some notes? Please go ahead. No, please, Bumaya. I just uh, write down in the chat room. So please, maybe because my connection is not stable, so I write it down. Maybe uh, from uh, Prof. Felicitas, yeah. Uh, Some highlights yeah. that might inspiring <laughs> for our inspire our students here yeah, for their final project. Yeah, I have read it down. Uh, thank yeah, you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for uh, uh, the notes in the chat. Yeah, uh, this is addressed. Uh, the question is addressed to uh, Professor Felicitas. Uh, we we uh would like to ask some highlights from mm -hmm. from you uh, mm -hmm. related to uh, on research related to gender in the context of, of urban and regional planning that might urgent in indonesia uh, that it might inspire our students for their final projects Please, yeah, thank that. you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm delighted to answer. I hope I can answer because that question came out of the blue for me in a, in a way. And I know Semarang a bit. I've been there, I think, three or four times at least and also with students. So I appreciate to know more about the city. And one thing I would shed light on is, of course, the mobilities, for example, from Demac of young women from Demac to the textile industries you have in Semarang or the industries and to know more about their mobility pattern, the way they work, the, they live, that would be interesting also for environmental planning, how to integrate them into um, um, environmental programs, that would be interesting. I would love to see more um, research on how public transport works for men and women, if there's a difference. That is certainly, traffic is certainly a big, uh, big issue. The role of women in uh, community planning, that is, uh, that is another point I would see. That those are three, <laughs> three dimensions I think you should look at much more. And why the idea of uh, attachment to place is so prominent. I mean, I think this is a really Java, Java thing. <laughs> and I would like to learn more about it, if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just asking this because, you know, to be, well, I, I don't know, maybe Bulandung may have a different perception, yeah, because she conduct a class concerning gender, but I think in our department, uh, research related to gender uh, in the context of urban and regional planning is not very much explored. Uh, I know. Yet, yeah. I know. I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so she she's in a lonely position, but that is not good because I think if you look on the gender dimension, you have to understand the full picture. And that is interesting. And parts mm -hmm. of the solution to climate to the climate crisis are rooted in the way we act. So, mm -hmm. do we plant mangroves, or what is what is uh, which importance do we give to which action? And very often, sustainability is, has a female face, as I showed you on the activists. I wasn't mm -hmm. aware of that myself. So already to to look on that perspective on this grassroots on the way communities organize i think this is worth looking on and not only in one teaching class because you can't you feel alone already you are i mean it's not only landung being alone with that topic we we don't have so much in germany either so if that is of comfort for you. I was really getting angry in the past weeks when I was preparing the talk because I noticed yesterday is the day integrating gender issues into the COP, which of course is important because half of the world is female, but it was not discussed. And so it means that as women, you always have to struggle to be seen. And in the moment you don't show up, the, the topic is, is over. So it's, it's a marathon. And I was just a bit confused that the topic has been imparted, important in the 80s and 90s, and then mm -hmm. there was less yeah. attention to it in the past years. And this must have to do with the introduction of new technologies, which are male dominated, which point on extravism. So mm -hmm. how to exploit nature for the benefit of economies. 
and I would say this is the moment to, to ask ourselves, is that the right way? Do we want to continue like that? We just can't. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are destroying the earth. So I think it's very good to have a gender perspective in without saying that, that women are the better persons. Certainly not, but they have to have a voice about the way they think to, uh, on knowledge. For example, another point, uh, the fishermen communities. Also here, there's a gender dimension of um, working. I'm not sure how it looks like exactly, but I understood, for example, that many of the fishermen uh, many of the fisher um, understand very well how um, the tides, how to navigate, and they look at the clouds and they can understand what is going on. And um, in the moment you come in with technologies, new technologies, you destroy this traditional knowledge. And it's a very aggressive fight we see. And we have to shed light on such fights also. I mean, we, as academics, we stay away from that activist perspective. And, and I'm, I'm, fully, I'm fully devoted, I'm a fully devoted academician, I would say. And, but when studying the gender topic, I understood, no, we really have to look also on what activists tell us and what is going on. So we have to listen to the voice of women. And for example, Landung, I was astonished when you said, so there are, um, what was it? So the, the definition of poor was not clear to me. And then on slide um, eight, you said that there's a percentage not working. And I wonder what this mm -hmm. idea of not working is because um, this is part of the story that we see only the uh, male and income related work as we work, but we all know that uh, care work is as important for the whole of the society to continue. So you already see that I, I was getting angry when I was preparing the talk because I thought we are much more developed in that field, but we are not. Not in Germany, not in Indonesia, nowhere over the place. And we lose ground if we don't keep an eye on it. I mean, it's mm -hmm. about us to, to push that topic mm -hmm. and to find new solutions, which, which are more sustainable as planting mangroves and um, seeing if we can find community solutions in neighborhoods which should be um, teared down for the benefit of big houses, which are against the interests of women often because they rely on their social networks. And, but there are many things to talk about. So you should put gender into your research portfolio, absolutely. And I'm happy to give you some guest lectures because I will continue to work on that. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you very, thank you very much, Professor. Yeah, yeah thank I you very also... much for your... Answer. Okay, Blando. Yeah, I would also comment that on your uh, uh, initial uh, presentation that um, I'm feeling more energi energetic when um, you uh, share your presentation. It's like, oh, I'm coming to this kind of atmosphere again. So, so glad that you uh, give this kind of uh, um, enlightenment to the students. It's, it's quite uh, difficult to put uh, gender perspective, not, not, uh, not only uh, looking at gender relation and gender roles, but gender perspective itself, because um, it's socially constructed and we have different uh, ethnics and tribes that have uh, patrilineals and matrilineals and also a combination of both uh, cultural contexts. And why I always mention to the students that gender is important because then we should um, challenge ourselves as urban planners or, or, or regional planners not to uh, produce um, mainstream or general uh, urban documents, urban planning documents, but we should uh, uh, looking at their uh, profile, specific profile, and we can accommodate their interest their needs so um, gender is details but it's comprehensive and that's why I said in the initial presentation that uh, the national governments uh, finally enacted since 2000 uh, by a presidential decree that gender uh, should incl uh, included in the national development uh, planning implementation program and planning implementation 
because uh, looking at the gender perspective, then we can see the program roadmaps. So uh, for example, the reliability on um, disaggregated data, uh, ensure that our program uh, develops, not only uh, coin uh, targeted on um, project uh, approach or orientation. That's my comment. Thank you very much. If I just may reply for a moment on that. Um, yeah. um, what you say about matricial lines of the term. Ma the um, yeah, exactly. That is so interesting because there's so little knowledge about it. So it would be already uh, a step further if we would have research showing how that works and if there's mm -hmm. a difference to patricial line. We don't know. And um, yeah, what you say, it's, it's already um, difficult to do something out of the normal box of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that is always more difficult, but it's also more interesting, I would say, because you, you can find new perspectives. And um, I could imagine that also the religious um, affiliation of Indonesia as being a Muslim country mm -hmm. <laughs> is, uh, is playing a role. But I cannot judge on that. But uh, as I told you, I was astonished that also in the Western world, mm -hmm. we have problems with the topic. We have problems yeah. to acknowledge that certain technologies are designed by men, for example, and are, are just referring to men. I just give you an example about these uh, technologies uh, that um, identify the voice. And so I have a transcription program and I noticed that the voices of women were not um, transcribed as well as the voices of male oh. um, interview partners. And then I, I talked to the person mm -hmm. who was responsible and he said, yeah, maybe that we haven't found the, 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 the reason, but it's true. It's more difficult to transcribe women. And the point is that the designers of the technologies were all male. They just, the standard was the man. Mm -hmm. And we find this in all in all fields of research. All the medications we get are medications mm -hmm. for the health sector, medications that are designed to male bodies. And uh, so if you have a problem, a heart problem, you get the same medication as a man would do. But of course, your size is different and you have mm -hmm. to, to tax differently uh, to... to um, to, to, to have knowledge about how that works in your body and it's not there. So this gender blindness yeah. is all over the place yeah. because it's so difficult to understand and because it's so difficult to know if there is this sort of sex or men, only men, women and all what is in between and you don't want to victimize women and you want to empower them and... <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a very complicated topic and it's not a topic you can do as one docent in, in a big university. You need mm. much more persons working on that. And yeah, okay, I stop here. <laughs> thank you, Felicitas. Yeah, thank you, Felicitas. Uh, Professor Felicitas for your uh, yeah, encouragement for the student to uh, do some research about uh, this uh, topic, it's very interesting. So I will give uh, the opportunity for the participants again to raise your questions. Yeah, I think it's Intan, please, Intan. Sorry, Intan, I cannot hear you. Okay, hello. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Uh, I have question of for all the lectures here, uh, because previously Prof. Felicitas already mentioned about the menstruating gender in the governmental policy, and also uh, Bu Landu also mentioned about uh, RPGMN that stated about the gender, 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 gender policy like that. And mm. uh, as, as I read in the RPGMN, uh, we know that uh, in the government already uh, have the gender mass training in sports in every in We lost you in then. You are frozen.
you freeze? Yeah, I think so. Maybe you can write it into the chat. Yeah. Uh, but Bumaya, uh, can you get the first question to Prof. Felicitas? So while waiting for Intan, I will give you another opportunity for the audience. Intan, come back again. I'm sorry, maybe this unstable connection. Yes. Uh, my question is, uh, Bulandro, uh, uh, how would, uh, in your opinion, how far the government can translate uh, the gender gender mainstreaming in the more technical policies? Like, we know that uh, there are a lot of indicators that, as you said before, and also, Prof. Felicitas also said there are uh, also many indicators for the women, and uh, how, how how it should be translated into more technical policies like this. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is uh, quite clear, the question from Inter related to the policy. So I will give the first opportunity for the Professor Felicitas. Yeah, if I can answer that, I mean, because that is a long process first to understand that there are maybe gender differences because we don't have the research, we don't have the knowledge and you have to base your arguments on some form of knowledge. So if the knowledge is missing, what do you say? So this is why we have to go back to the activists, but they are so active in being activists that they can't do research. So, mm. um, and that is a fundamental difference. So we need more research on the topic. That would be my first approach to better understand. And then um, we need to have also resources because um, I, I told you, I thought it was just a bit of funny that the idea that you should pay activists to be active on a topic. This is as if you would have a marionette because if you pay, you say what you want in the end. And that cannot be the solution because it's not trustworthy. Other people will say, oh, she's paid for that. I don't believe it. I mean, she, she's just doing that. So this doesn't seem to me to be a solution. What would be a solution is to have resources, funding in democratically organized institutions and um, you need more female uh, female mayors, you need more female uh, representatives in politics, of course. And uh, then you can hope that they, these women are not as much uh, under pressure that they can also, that they have a say. I mean, so I would see research, political representation, and of course, education also in schools and, and, and gender, gender aware, um, yeah, education, I would say. It's a long process. And what we need is resources. And normally we think, oh, this is just a luxury problem that women have there. And, and it's, it's, they are just easy to eliminate. And that is the problem. But I stop here, Landung. What do you think? You're much yeah. more into the topic. Uh, thank you, uh, Felicitas. Um, I agree with you. Uh, in terms of Indonesian context, maybe Intan asked about how to operationalize gender approach uh, to the program implementation. I would say first also the same, yeah. Um, maybe uh, awareness. We should um, put uh, consistent and persistent awareness. Um, we have uh, histories of long um, socialization to the decision maker, especially for the ministry and the ministry assistance level. Um, I happen to have uh, interview most of them uh, in a um, strategic insta insta inst agencies, for example, for ministry work, uh, housing ministry, social uh, worker, uh, social, um, Kementerian Social. Um, and then, um, uh, after we um, give long, consistent and persistent socialization uh, by training, by upgrading, uh, the, the most important thing is second, that um, people still um, understand that gender is sex. Gender is not genus clamming. Gender is different. Yeah? So when we uh, approach uh, gender, we should understand that gender is not an instrument for discrimination. 
but it's more than um, how to distinguish the different um, uh, profile of the um, uh, uh, national development um, mm. subject and object. And so people, communities, private sectors should also be included. So uh, when we talk about gender, it's not about oppression, it's not about discrimination, it's not about mm. uh, how emancipation are taking into control that women should be as a, of, uh, as a leader for everything, no. But we should understand that and also uh, uh, agree with Felicita that we should put that in a, a part of the system. So we should understand that in Indonesia, we also have a patrilineal context that every assets, every property, uh, uh, property uh, uh, inherited by male, but also in uh, um, several part of Indonesian uh, location, we have also matrilineal context that women also have their power for asset and property. And then uh, the last one, the third one, I uh, also believe that political will. So, um, it's not uh, it's not um, success if we only focus on the um, government agencies uh, or staff in the um, low level, but should also um, from the high level, ministerial level, should also included gender not only as part of a project output uh, orientation for example okay as long as a project there is a recipient of woman percentage is okay so we already uh, conducted gender mainstreaming policy it's not like that but should mm. uh, there should aware should integrate it into national policy program i think that's all my answer thank you yeah, if I may add, add two more precise examples. Um, for example, many years ago, when we had the first uh, United Nations um, attempts to have girls to school, so the the big programs to to send also girls to school and not only uh, boys. This mm -hmm. today is common knowledge, and that was mm -hmm. a quite new thing because the argumentation here was. Why should girls go to school? Because they're just marrying and they yeah. don't need that. And it's it's a, it's a, we are just um, giving away too many resources to them. Today, it's nobody would doubt that it's good to have an educated population, men and women, and girls and boys have to go to school, for example. Another example, uh, food programs. In the moment mm -hmm. you give food uh, resources within camps to women, mm -hmm. The whole mm -hmm. game changes. Mm -hmm. And if you just continue to give all the resources to men because they are the head of the household or whatsoever, you have the women in a difficult position. And those seem to be small things, but you can do something about it. And yeah, as Landung said, there must be a political will to do so. There must be a sort of value that you mm -hmm. appreciate to have mm -hmm. a have uh, equal equal um, possibilities for the two and three and four and five genders whatsoever. And yeah, I stop here. There are more questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Felicitas and Mulando. We have uh, another question here from Mediana Ardino Groho. She asked, uh, yeah, I just written here, thank you for uh, Professor Felicitas and Bunando for the great presentation. I would like to ask, do you think women's uh, involvement in planning and policy will create a different impact rather than gender neutral planning? Especially when we plan, we plan for resilient city or regions where usually women and children are more vulnerable from shock and stress. Very good question. Mm -hmm. so we Very keep, good uh, question. Yeah, may I go? May I go back to my presentation for a moment? Yeah, please. Just yes, to, please. Yeah. Mm, because I think it's a very interesting question. No wait, and I hope I must run through this for a moment. I have here one lady activist. Uh, 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 it's not working. Wait, one moment, please. I have here one lady activist, look at her. I think mm -hmm. it answers your question. Um, I do not know if you have heard about it. She wrote a book called The Death and Life of Great American Cities. And mm -hmm. she was 
how to say a nobody. Um, she was a secretary somewhere and she understood that the, in a way that the um, idea of reconstructing the cities as cities for cars. So constructing highways, constructing clear cut parks, um, setting up big, um, big um, tall houses to collect people in it. She understood that this was against the, against the mixed and more equal city in which women have also a say. And um, that would, this is about your question, there is no gender neutrality. There's always groups which profit from certain ideas mm -hmm. in planning and others do not, it must not be women. It could be also, uh, as I said before, the fishermen who are um, endangered by a big dam construction and nobody's taking care of them. I would say this is another problem we see that we do not try to see also the marginalized uh, groups in, in, in our planning. And But those are often those who have the solution. For example, if you go today to New York City, you, you'd love to go to, if, if, you, if you go, just to come back to that lady, Jane Jacobs, um, you would love to go to Washington Square. You will find a vibrant neighborhood, of course, gentrified and so on, but it's a neighborhood with a, with a strong mix with no high-rise high buildings and people are just living, working together and um, that wouldn't be there. There would be a big highway cross point if that lady would not have intervened. And the idea behind the planning was that the car-friendly city is the better city. So it's functional and you have certain parts of the town where you have the suburbs where all the mothers live with their children. And you have the CBD, the inner center. And I mean, you just have to think if that is really what you want to do as a planner in your town or even if, not the more lift city with um, is more sustainable in the end. Uh, let's think about urban gardening. All such approaches could have a say if you were open to accept them. So there is no gender neutrality, I would say. Excuse me, I'm going back now to Landung. Okay. <laughs> Just yeah, that lady. Yeah, thank you, Felicitas. Uh, I would uh, put... Uh, um, I would maybe um, try to answer your question, lady, in a short uh, answer. So the point is not how to include women into um, gender sensitive planning um, in, in any other cases of uh, planning uh, instrument or aspect. Yeah? But um, the question is that gender sensitive planning's um, ultimate objective is for equity. Um, I said before, it's not uh, for discriminated or appropriation. So we should not, um, uh, how do you call it? Uh, ask for um, dominant um, participation from only one uh, community groups or age groups, or um, you can call um, uh, any kind, uh, any level in the community. But we should all we should integrate include all the stakeholders, not only women. I remember my professor daughter say that if you want to have a uh, research on gender, you cannot only hear from uh, women, but you also have to hear from uh, other uh, participants, for example, from men, because uh, and the, uh, the 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 instrument is. Negotiating sameness and difference is important to um, to help you to learn uh, to have sensitivity that they have different um, needs and interests. So it's not only women, but should be also included all the stakeholders. Uh, the process called equality, but the um, end point or the outcome is equity. So you should. Um, as call many uh, participants as much, so you can have a uh, objective per, uh, objective point of view or perspective. Thank you. 
very much. Thank you very much for Professor Felicitas and Burando for answering the question from Medi. We still have one question for uh, Professor Felicitas. It is, the question is from Naufal Hilmi Pratama regarding the climate vulnerabilities on low-lying islands low-lying islands. In the COP26 meeting, uh, the Prime Minister of Barbados mentioned that, that climate change and sea level rise is a dead sentence for the people of the low-lying island countries because it is uh, an existential threat for, the, for them. Is there already research on the possibility of mass migration from these countries to uh, due to the sea level rise. Thank you. So this is about uh, climate change and migration. Mm -hmm. One moment, I have to think for a moment on that. Uh -huh. So thank you for that, for that question. Um, yeah, as you might know, because I think you're a colleague. Um, no, we have, we don't have research on that because um, it's a recent phenomenon. As you might know, we did research on Semarang and Keta in Ghana to understand the relationship between migration and climate change. We then spoke of environmental change because climate change is just exacerbate, exacerbating what we see in terms of of degradation and we couldn't make the linkage be between um, between uh, sea level rise and uh, migration because migration is such a complex um, activity and normally people were not aware for example in africa people in ghana people were not aware uh, if the, the dry season was again there, how often the floodings have been. So we are not machines. We don't have the overview on what's happening and we don't have the information. For example, for Semoang, when we did the research on Semoang, we were just having problems to understand if it's uh, sea level rise provoking the floodings. And in the end, we had to see that it's uh, the, the land subsidence or the, the, the interplay between land subsidence and sea level rise. And uh, a major cause was also that uh, different water engineering systems were not working well together. So it was an engineering problem also over the past 200 years or so. So it was very difficult to say, and this will be the argumentation also when it comes to Barbados, what is the reason for the uh, sea level rise? Is it also sinking of the islands or what's going on? And of course, mass migration, I think for Tuvalu, you have that, that uh, refugees, climate refugees are uh, acknowledged, but um, it, it's a hot topic at the moment. And we will discuss it at the Metropolis Conference. So I invite you to come there or to participate with a presentation and I really hope we can talk more about it. We were um, a bit, um, we were hoping to find a, to find more uh, a linkage between climate change and migration, but we couldn't see it because all the adaptation strategies, the possibilities to cope with disasters was so different for the different local contexts. So I wouldn't dare to give an overall comment on that. And it's mainly NGOs and the, um, the uh, big, big so advocacy uh, groups that say that we will have these mass migrations. Of course, in the moment where we have um, typhoons and, and quick um, rapid, rapid um, degradation processes, then people are relocated and stuff like that. But all the slow processes are difficult to understand and it's difficult to say if migration is taking place due to sea level rise or if the overall degradation of the economy because this uh, place is no longer a regional capital or whatsoever plays a role in it. So we have to do research, yeah, and we have to understand what's going on. And then we can find also solutions. And here we need the genuine knowledge, I think, knowledge about traditional forms of, um, of cultivation, for example, which has been lost. As you know, for Simawang also, it 
part of the problem is that the mangroves have been cut and you you have fish ponds also my computer is just excuse me you have now fish ponds which brings money but it doesn't bring you back your stability in the um for the city so apologies i have to find energy here um so all that is a very complex picture and we have to look on it at it certainly so thank you for the question yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Felicitas, for the uh, uh, answering the questions. And uh, if you want to uh, write down the link to the conference in the meeting chat, so the the participants can uh, see it in detail about the conference that you uh, offer us to attend. Because uh, previously you only presented briefly. Uh, do you mind to do it? Yeah, Professor Felicitas. Hello. Excuse me, I was losing my, my energy on the. What did you say? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. In in the end of your presentation, you mentioned about the conference. Uh, ah, yeah, is, yeah, yeah, uh, okay. of uh, yeah. Of course, yeah. Putting on, ah, I yeah, can do that. Yeah, yeah, I will. Chat. Yeah. yeah. Excuse me, I was. The, um, I was so somewhat on. running out of energy here. <laughs> so, but, uh, yeah, I think uh, we, we come to the end mm -hmm. of this uh, sessions. Wait. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, not only Bulanum who uh, have a, uh, get the good energy after uh, after your presentation and also me, myself, I get the uh, very enlightenment not, uh, uh, from both of the speaker today. I hope the student also get the, the same feelings and that uh, we need to be critics on the our uh, surroundings, particularly when we learn about the urban and regional plannings. We need to, uh, yeah, we need to be, uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, thank you very much, Professor Felicitas, for the link. So yeah, everyone just see can... there's an English website, and it will be yeah. um, active in in a moment. In in latest in December, and yeah, and yeah. we are putting together the program. So let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Hopefully, uh, we can attend uh, the conference. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the uh, presentation today for the both uh, Professor Felicitas and Lando uh, Bulando. Uh, once again, uh, we got a very good uh, in, in, not only impressions but also knowledge and uh, yeah, it's very valuable and fruitful uh, discussion for the, uh, this afternoon. And uh, I also once again want to apologize for any uh, any inconvenience due to the technical problems and other things related to discussions. And hopefully, Professor Felicitas would uh, like maybe one day to give another uh, speech for us, maybe. Yeah. Or maybe you can come to Samarang to oh, That would uh, be nice, yeah, us. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, we are, we are waiting for you. <laughs> OK, yeah, that is sure. excellent, yeah. <laughs> Look forward to Abu Felicitas. I will learn some Indonesian before. <laughs> OK. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you very much again. And, uh, and the Batek as well, Abu Felicitas. Also. No, no, also. Yeah. I, I remember uh, the Jinko story. Did, did you still remember mm -hmm. the Jinko story? Which one? The Jinko story and the durians uh, with Usa? Uh, the fruit, durians. The fruit. Ah, yeah, of course. Stinky yeah. fruits. The stinky, <laughs> yeah, the stinky fruits. fruits. Yeah. yeah, of course. Of course. I remember. Yeah. 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 Um, no, I will certainly come. Mm -hmm. Hello, Belly. How are you? Hi, Ivan. Hey. <laughs> Sorry, just joined. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Good to see you. Oh, not good to see to you any longer. Yeah. You're, you're out. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, I think uh, we need to end the session. Uh, thank yeah. you very much again for the. You speak uh, soon, the, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, for the speak for the speakers and also for the participants. Thank you very much for your attendance and for the very uh, critical question that you arise for the both uh, speaker today. 
And um, once again, thank you very much. And hopefully we can see uh, you again uh, soon. Thank you. Uh, Felicitas, a uh, moment, moment oh, later. Yeah. A picture, taking picture. Oh yeah, yeah, I forgot about that once. Can we take a picture before we end the sessions? Yes. Yeah, please do so. Hmm? Yeah, Intan, you can lead the yeah. picture yeah. sessions. I will Go take ahead. a screenshot. Am I too white? It's page. so so page. much light here in my One, two, office. Uh, maybe participants can yeah. open the camera. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. <laughs> For the first slide. Um, One, two, three. Okay, for the next one. Again, one, two, three for the first slide. Okay, for the next slide there. Are no. Okay. Thank you, Bu Landung and Bu Maya. I already screenshot all the slides. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much, okay. 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 Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, hope you have a very good uh, afternoon and see you again. Sound like home. Have a nice evening. Bye bye. Bye bye.